Hi, you're listening to Tangents, a new podcast from Coin Center, where, as Naraj said a couple episodes, we talk about pretty much whatever we like. My guest today is Ivor Cummings, who is a, a YouTube personality. He's got a great podcast um, as the Fat Emperor that I recommend you subscribe to. And I want to explain real briefly uh, why we wanted to have him on the show. So, Ivor, welcome to Tangents. Hey, thanks, Peter. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm super lucky. Um, so, Naraj's uh, summary of tangents, where we talk about whatever we want, is not quite right. It's supposed to be tangents to cryptocurrency or tangents to decentralized technology. So, how can we bridge this gap to Ivor, who I've wanted to have on the show for a while? I think it's actually pretty clear. So, essentially, I wanted to have you on for a couple reasons. Uh, not primarily because there happens to be a large overlap between the keto community and the crypto communities, which I think is actually quite interesting and we can talk about later. And also not just because you, Ivor, happen to be sort of a personal uh, hero of mine who I owe a debt. So by the way, I, I started watching your YouTube channel about two and a half years ago and I lowered my blood pressure um, from 140 over 90 down to 115 over uh, about 70 on a good day. So. I think I'm metabolically much happier, primarily because of you. But the main reason I wanted to have you on is because, to me, you embody this kind of uh, DIY spirit that also pervades, uh, for better and sometimes for worse, the cryptocurrency community. Um, and just briefly, what I mean by that is, you know, in the crypto community, there's this spirit that a bunch of technology savvy and smart folks who are not from sort of mainstream fields, over the last 15 years realized that the financial sector specifically uh, was not innovating. It was sort of stuck in a rut, stuck in old ideas that seemed hopelessly outdated, uh, stuck in a kind of dark ages, if you will. Uh, and they decided to innovate financial technologies themselves, uh, even though maybe they're not quite qualified in the traditional way to do so, right out of their garages. And so, the reaction to that is interesting. You know, we've, we've got these new technologies, we've still got the legacy financial sector, uh, and the legacy financial sector doesn't think too kindly of what the crypto community does. You know, they either think that we're building the wrong things arrogantly, or we just have no idea what we're doing whatsoever. Uh, you know, you hear questions like, who really wants an immutable ledger? You should be able to reverse a financial transaction, like a chargeback on a credit card, or why would we want machine to machine transactions when it's just people who really need to transact? Or why would we need a computer program to execute a legal agreement? This is smart contracts, which we don't have to get into. And why would you in general want to rely on a decentralized cloud of strangers um, when you could trust your banker or your lawyer? Um, but I think despite those criticisms, we are right. And that's just now after about 15 years starting to become much more obvious. So, I hope in my little exegesis about crypto, some of this sort of rings true for you, because I think a lot of what you've been talking about for the last five, maybe longer, uh, I've only been following you for the last three or so years, is also starting to become more evidently and obviously true, even though it's counter-orthodoxy. And I'm speaking specifically about your experience with nutrition, although we can go into some of the COVID-19 uh, issues later in the podcast. But I wanted to just start out for our listeners um, with you explaining uh, what first got you into nutrition. Um, it's a story I've heard on some of your YouTube um, videos, but I think it's a story that should be told as much as possible. Yeah, okay, Peter, then um, I'll keep it fairly quick. So in 2012, essentially, I'm a biochemical engineer, uh, graduated in 1990 spend around 20 years mainly leading in complex problem solving, you know, solving very complex interactional issues in the engineering high volume products kind of. Uh, What's an example or, product? Because you've, you've told me, you've, you've oh, said this before, but I'm always curious what the products might be. Yeah, I spent several years in R&D uh, creating new dialyzers for kidney dialysis units and hemoperfusion, activated carbon, you know, to clear the blood of dialysis patients. And then I moved into special purpose equipment manufacturer, 3D design of, you know, large automated equipment. And then I spent most of the time then in electrofluidics, inkjet technology. So very high volume, kind of complex electrofluidics. 
And that was where I spent most of my time in Hewlett Packard, almost 20 years actually. Oh, wow. So it was always though the same theme, complex systems, multi-variable interacting factors and resolving issues fast, saving a lot of money. Um, so with all that background and the biochemical original background, which was my favorite kind of subject in, in college, the, the chemistry of life, uh, I didn't really pursue that during my career. But then I circled back because in 2012, got some random blood tests Three of the values were way out of whack. And I just looked at the sh report and I said, whoa, you know, I'm up at three sigma or beyond. And um, like when I questioned the doctor. Or, hmm? This is like a lipid panel or? The cholesterol was too high. The gamma glutamyl transferase or gamma GT, GGT, which is a liver enzyme, was way too high. And the serum ferritin, which is an iron loading in the blood, was way too high. Mm -hmm. So the latter two were much more important than cholesterol. I didn't realize that at the time. And they were also the ones who were re really far out. And they're actually, it turned out after my research, I found out they're indications of insulin resistance and inflammatory pressures in the body. So, but that, that came later. Right. So I question, you know, I've been brought in so many times in my career when a team is kind of struggling with a complex problem and the business is getting hurt, I tend to get brought in and take it over. So I'm well used to going in and asking the two key questions up front. You know, what are the root causes you're looking at? Show me the data. And what are the implications, the customer impact? Yeah. So I asked the doctor those questions, right? Here we got a technical issue. It's going to be the same questions. What's the morbidity risk with these values being high? You know, the implications. And B, well, what are the root causes? Because I knew I wasn't a genetic mutant. I instinctively knew <laughs> that these numbers are going to change if I do something different. Yeah. And the answers were terrible. Just so weak. I went to another Ter doctor. Terrible, not like bad news. Terrible, like they can't give you answers, right? Vague. Yeah. Vague. You know, the, the serum ferritin might be hemochromatosis, which is a condition uh, more common in Irish extraction people. Mm. Uh, I got a genetic test. It wasn't. So then they were stumped. Uh, the GGT is associated with excessive alcohol and alcoholics, and that's all they really know about it. What they didn't realize was it's a marker for uh, diabetic insulin resistant physiology, a huge marker. Mm -hmm. They don't actually know this. But at the time, all I knew is they were giving me really bugger all. And the second doctor, same thing, family friend, same thing. And then I went Eat to a very fat, senior. Right? Is that the mm -hmm. advice? Eat less fat was the advice? Oh, the advice was generic. For the cholesterol, the best they could manage was more healthy whole grains, less fat, which I found out was diametrically opposite what you do to improve cholesterol profiles. But anyway, um, so third one was a professor of medicine, teaching professor in a major university. And amazingly, that person as well had nothing really to add. And then I realized there's something massive going on here because these are standard tests yeah. that they do all the time. And they can't answer the two key questions. And they are the experts in fairness. They are experts in their field. And these were good guys. Mm -hmm. So I said, how can that happen? How can they not know their own craft? I said, there, there must be something massive here to be discovered. So I began to research. And in a few weeks, I had it uh, because that's what I do. So I went to ResearchGate, PubMed, I had corporate logons, and I just followed the three markers through the last 100 years of research and published papers. And I got my way straight to carbohydrate metabolism, um, and then into the whole cholesterol and lipoprotein uh, science. And I realized everything we've been told for around 40 or 50 years is not just wrong, it's, it's the opposite of what one should do to resolve these issues. And then I realized I was correct. There was something huge, but it took me longer to find out all of the corporate shenanigans mm. and all of the bad influences and bias funding of science that was used over decades to keep the, the wrong, incorrect paradigms alive because they were hugely profitable to the food and the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, they're, they are the cornerstone. These bad paradigms, are the cornerstone of continued uh, quarterly revenues yeah. for both industries. And then you went online and shared all this. I mean, I, th I think 
you get a lot of credit or you should have a lot of credit for that because you didn't keep it to yourself and you've sort of, you, you don't still have a, a, a day job as a biochemical engineer, right? You, this is your day job now, right? Essentially, yeah. I mean, I worked uh, for the last couple of years when I finished with Hewlett Packard, they closed down development in Ireland, which mm -hmm. I was expecting. So it actually worked out well. I worked for David Bobbitt, an entrepreneur who had a mission to save the world from heart disease, which lined up with mine and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness, IHDA.ie. We've ended that contract and I've kind of struck out independent. But yeah, it's been two and a half years since I was in my corporate job. Yeah. So we won't sort of regurgitate all of your excellent content. We'd never even have the time. Uh, I'd just like to tell our listeners that if you're interested in nutritional science and a sort of fresh look from someone who's not coming from the orthodoxy and not coming from sort of big agra lobbyist uh, policies, you should check out Ivor's channels. You should support him on Patreon. I, I think one of the most amazing things that you do is in some of your larger lectures, like hour long lectures, your PowerPoint slides, where you actually get to mechanism for nutritional issues, you know, root causes, explaining them step by step, which could be terrifying because as you said, these are massively complex systems. These are probably the most complex systems in the world you still are able to reduce them with clip art, uh, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way at all, um, but good clip art and good uh, drawings to help somebody who's you know, got some basic level of understanding come to understand why maybe this makes sense. And I find that so refreshing because normally we're fed pyramids, literally food guide pyramids that just say, eat this much, and doesn't, doesn't tell you why, other than the fact that, well, it, it's whole. It's a whole grain, it's healthy, so eat 12 servings of it. Um, but what I did want to talk about, uh, so as I said, you know, there's, there's a lot of similarities here between the cryptocurrency community where you have people who say, you know, it's nonsense that it takes, uh, four to five days for a, a wire transfer to go through just to pay someone internationally. And it's nonsense that that is the case and there's fees associated with that when we could just use a peer-to-peer -peer network to send money like we use peer-to-peer -peer networks to send data over the internet instantly. And so people built these alternative systems from the ground up as sort of a grassroots mo movement, just like you and a lot of other people I admire like Amber O'Hearn and Chris Nob have sort of built a grassroots movement in the low carb, uh, high fat, diet community um, or lifestyle community because it's not even really a diet um, per se. And so one thing that we run into into the crypto space, as I said, where we, we are this upstart with some good ideas and maybe better methodology, uh, but there's this legacy player out there is credentialism. So you know, people say, you're not qualified to build that. You're not qualified to talk about that. I'm curious, I've never actually seen much of this, but do you get uh, called out? you get hate mail for not being a doctor and giving medical advice? Do you worry about lawsuits? Mm, okay. So <laughs> I, I do occasionally, but to be honest, uh, when the people with the credentials cannot even really fully follow and realize they don't even understand in many cases what I'm going through and they have to watch my stuff simply to learn it, yeah, it kind of knocks them back a lot, you know, because if they truly knew their craft and they could just simply point out I was incorrect, they could really enjoy the credentialism uh, attack, <laughs> but they can't. They so, so that's a powerful weapon. I mean, I, I've given lectures like one in Miami in 2017 on the deeper mechanisms of insulin resistance and uh, ad adipose tissue, you know, and all the hormones related to adipose tissue. and even the 30 or 40 doctors in the room who were on my side said afterwards, well, look, it was great, but you know, we'll have to watch it on YouTube a few times to internalize it. So I have this huge advantage because I'm guessing, I'm not sure, Brian, but I'm guessing the financial folks probably straight up conflict with what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, and they broadly understand it. But yeah. in this case, I have an advantage because they don't actually know the nutrition. They don't do it in college. They don't actually know the metabolic pathways. So they actually don't even know the stuff. So that was great. And also I, I have 20 
plus years of corporate management and technical leadership. So I'm actually very savvy in how to craft arguments and create pitfalls and traps. So I often lead them along in an argument on Twitter. And then I pull my trap, my logic trap, I like because it. that's my whole life. And then they're, they're left flailing and yeah. then they just go away. So there's lots of things. <laughs> uh, it doesn't bother me in the least. You know, that's funny. So, so actually, I think we might be in very similar situations there as well. So I'm a lawyer by training. I went to NYU. Uh, uh, I don't actually practice. I didn't decide to take the bar exam uh, in D.C., where I work because I work in policy. We talk to government about this technology to hopefully give them the, the information they need to make good decisions and to not crush this nascent movement before it can you know, deliver on its promises. Um, but I, I agree with you that, that understanding corporate speak, which can be horrible uh, and, and mind numbing, is extremely useful nonetheless, because you can sort of, you can work with people up to the point where you need to give them some very unfortunate news for them that, you know, X that they believed might not be worth believing in, uh, or, you know, Y is inevitable. So, you know, you got to get on board because we definitely have the same situation. And as far as your, your, your earlier point about they don't see it coming or they don't, they don't have the the sort of frame of reference to understand and take advantage of a sort of a credentialism type position. I think it is similar in the cryptocurrency community because of something that we often refer to, and I forget the uh, nonfiction author who first popularized the term, but um, the innovator's dilemma, which is this notion that, you know, big, uh, long-standing monopolistic players who sort of control an industry, they get a notion of what an industry is. You know, the, um, the taxi and limousine service industry knows what taxi and limousine service looks like. It looks like a depot and a fleet of cars and a phone number to ha hail a cab. And that's their entire frame of reference. That's what they, they know is important about what they do. They don't understand smartphones. They don't understand apps. And so even though it will ultimately be an existential threat to their position, either economically or epistemologically, they can't comprehend that disruption would be coming from this place. And this is the innovator's dilemma. Uh, and I, I think if you are well entrenched in the medical establishment, and now I'm just guessing, um, if you've gone to med school or if you write peer reviewed nutritional research, you've got a blind spot in the biochemical engineering department. Um, so someone like you who can talk eloquently and, uh, intelligently about root causes and, and, and methodology doesn't necessarily speak their same language right off the bat. And so they don't see this as a, as a sort of threat to their um, credentialism or their, their position in the world. Yeah, no, absolutely agreed. Uh, they, the vast majority of them out there, the so-called credentialed, have enormous blind spots. Now, there, are, there is a small cadre or a cabal of credentialed experts who do actually have a very good grasp of the underlying science. And they're interesting because they argue far more effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, they even produce papers and studies that are artfully constructed, mm -hmm. you know, to line up with the way they want to see the world. Um, so there's some very clever actors out there as well in lipidology or in pharmacology or even in the diet wars. And they construct trials, the bigger fish, and they kind of put their finger on the scales and they bias the way the trial is designed to tend to give the answer that suits them. So it's a very interesting question with some of these latter people. Uh, are they truly deceitful or are they just cognitive dissonance? Uh, or do they really just believe what they're saying, like that carbs are good and fat is still bad Does and it, they just instinctively design the experiments subconsciously to tilt them uh, and you could you can never tell for sure but the vast majority you're absolutely right huge blind spots yeah. blind belief systems they don't see the disruptive technology coming they don't even understand it yeah. and they think it's tinfoil hat stuff and they don't even do the work to understand it they don't want to they just want to keep parroting really funny yeah. You know, we also have sort of a, an elite class of people in the legacy space who do understand the tech, who do understand peer-to-peer -peer networks and do understand cryptography. And I think 
um, I think it's somewhat similar. They are, they are the, the more dangerous adversary in this space mm. because I still think that our stuff is righteous, right? Um, and, but they know how to attack it. They know how to attack it, sometimes in, in genuine ways and sometimes in disingenuous ways. There are newsletters that feature uh, myself and my, my coworkers at Coin Center, even though we're just an innocent little nonprofit trying to educate government about cryptocurrency talking about things like, oh, these people are pushing this money laundering technology. These people are trying to destroy the world. These people have naive ideas about what their tech can do, but they can actually delve into the tech and, and rightfully point out weaknesses that need to be addressed. And so it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation. Yeah. And you, you know, that's an actually interesting point you reminded me of. Um, I always spend time with my detractors, especially those guys, uh, because my view for decades now problem solving, I long ago left behind cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. uh, except I still got caught out with it occasionally. So I am <laughs> utterly paranoid that my hypothesis in a big issue, mm -hmm. millions of dollars being lost, my hypothesis is, is wrong. Yeah. You know, it seems correct. I'm pretty sure. But I know it's possible on Friday when I get the experimental results, they might come back not proving what we think. So I'm always paranoid looking for the black swan. What am I missing? What am I missing? Because I never want to be wrong. I'm obsessed. Yeah. So I actually spend a lot of time with retractors to make sure they're the devil's advocate, to make sure they haven't got a point somewhere. Yeah. Because if they do, I'm going to be have to adjust my angle. Uh, so I use them for that. I think they're the most valuable thing. The people who agree with you are dangerous because they can just reinforce your belief that you're right. But you're right. Continuous improvement is actually to focus on your enemy. And when they make a kind of a quasi or, or good point, potentially, you feel that little chill. Mm -hmm. They could have a point here. You go after it. Overwhelmingly, you find out they're just being deceitful and twisting things. But, but the odd time, they have a little nugget. Yeah. It's, it's, it's similar here too. So, you know, we always take sincere criticism to heart and there's a lot to criticize in the cryptocurrency community because there are people who just want to use this to launder money. And there are even worse people who build sort of cargo cult versions of the technology and then try and raise money from vulnerable investors. And I actually yeah. think probably 80 or 90% of what we do at Coin Center is yelling at our own community sometimes calling them out it's, and saying, you, you got to be better than this. Like there's a core here that is infinitely valuable, but if we pollute it with this garbage on the side, nobody in government will ever listen to us and we will be, we will be regulated out of existence. Yeah. Exactly. And low carb keto, especially, um, and somewhat carnivore, but the carnivore guys are actually quite good considering how extreme they'd be perceived, yeah. but it's the same problem. Uh, extreme, like eat sticks of butter, shove in the fat to make yeah. yourself ketotic. Uh, all this is bad news, promoting all these shakes and products and commercializing keto. No, it has to be like you said at the start, it's a lifestyle. It's not a productized kind of fad. Yeah. And it's the same kind of challenge. And even on COVID, we won't get into it here, but a frustrating thing is a couple of marches that are going on quite rightly attacking the current responses worldwide, which are draconian and absurd, given the real impact level and the data. The problem is I see a march and there's vaccine stuff being screeched about and, you know, world order stuff. Then I can't go. And I know huge amounts of rational doctors, you know, professionals who are fully with me on the problem we're seeing with COVID, they can't actually go along in an open public march because you get the smell of extremism off it and you can't, you can't touch it. Yeah, and there's a lot of bad stuff there. I, I wanted to talk mm. a little bit later about YouTube and how they um, are a platform for people with new ideas, but they also, they do have some responsibility with respect to misinformation yeah. and you wouldn't want to get caught up in that. Um, I did. You did mention uh, the black swan in the problem of induction, uh, which is sort of sort of taken from Hume. This notion that one one new study comes out and you might need to revisit all of your priors uh, with respect to your theories, and that's important because you don't want to get you don't want to get caught blindsided by that or be the person who who held on to a bad uh, hypothesis for fifty years, like the yeah. 
like the, um, the diet fat hypothesis. Um, so what is it that's different about your background? Um, I, I'm assuming maybe it's the biochemistry or m maybe it's, it's being in the private sector for a long time, in the corporate world for a long time. How is it that you're able to um, sort of work from deduction and then use induction occasionally uh, as necessary to, to sort of support the axiom, axioms that you're deducing? Um, why doesn't the medical community writ large reason from root cause and reason from actual mechanism? And, and why do you? <laughs> okay. Well, just to get the medical out of the way, it's the nature of the education system. Uh, my own daughter has just completed first year medicine in one of the top colleges mm -hmm. and uh, is shocked because she has an awareness through me. And she just fed back to me. In first year, they do the kind of biochemistry and cholesterol and all this stuff. Yep. And shockingly, she said, that's it, what they've done. And it didn't get anywhere near the important stuff. Not near it. No nutrition. It was awful. And I said, what do you mean, that's it? And she said, no, second year, third year and all goes into clinical and everything. That's it. We're done in first year. So they had done nothing of the really important stuff. And it was over in a few months. So that's doctors, unfortunately, they get nothing of the important stuff. And I think it's rote learning. It's knowing basic ways to problem solve, but not the deeper ways of root cause. They just don't get prepared. Uh, and then when they go into practice, they're completely crazy busy trying to drive their career, trying to keep up with the health systems. They, they haven't got time to research yeah. themselves yeah, and they might not have the aptitude. Yeah. They might not have the aptitude. I mean, people who go into medicine now, it's massively based on rote learning and getting the top 0.1% mm -hmm. of academic uh, achievement numbers. Otherwise, you don't go to, you can't go in. So they're not a cohort that's a natural, instinctive problem solver, technical person. Not at all. So how do we fix that? What, what's, what's wrong with higher ed? Should, should we just drop it and go to uh, like internships? Like one thing I've always thought in the legal community, you used to be able to, and you still can in a few states, become barred simply by being an apprentice to a practitioner for a number of years. And you learn that on the ground knowledge. In legal academia, well, I have to say I enjoyed law school as almost like a consumer good because you get to just talk and argue and think about big thoughts was not particularly practical about what lawyers actually need to do. H how do we get doctors to be more focused and how do we get the education of doctors to be more focused on practicalities and good methodology and things like nutrition? There, there's major problems there. We have to be honest about it. So around several decades ago, the pharmaceutical industry grew enormously in power and there's no conspiracy here, but a lot of continued medical education credits, a lot of liaisons with universities and medical schools. Pharma is so deep into that, so powerful and so wily and clever. They're almost, they're just now embedded in each other. It's kind of like a pharma medical education complex. So I don't know how anyone's going to change it when, when that's the case, because pharma is ruthlessly against teaching doctors root cause and fixing root cause because it, it, it's not only zero profit. Yeah. It's a direct competitive threat. The whole business and its huge revenues depends on people throwing a Band-Aid, you know, on a, a sucking chest wound. And that's the business, <laughs> you know. And so I would say a lot of the medications now, um, I'm not anti-medications. I think statins are appropriate in certain circumstances, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is fixing the root causes for most modern chronic disease like diabetes type 2, Alzheimer's, uh, even Parkinson's, a lot of the cancers, insulin-sensitive cancers, yada, yada, yada. A lot of modern chronic disease, fixing the root causes through diet and lifestyle will utterly eviscerate or blow away the beneficial effect of medications, most of them. So the medications don't do nothing. Uh, they do a little something. Uh, you will blow it away with fixing the root causes. Interesting. Uh, so that's why root cause fixing, low carb, magnesium, potassium, UV exposure, all the root causes that kept us healthy before the era of massive chronic disease, 
actually having those public and understood and adopted uh, would have an enormous impact on the bottom line if it was actually adopted. So I think that understanding is there at the top and, and there's a resistance. So that's why you see all the anti-low carb articles, mm -hmm. anti-vitamin D articles, pro sunscreen, pro pharmaceuticals. The whole system is corporatized. We, we're in a fishbowl and the water are all around us is all the messages and against the actual facts and the root cause. You know, this is good. So, I, I never thought about this until now, but my, my law background has me thinking that patents have got to be part of the problem because you can patent a medication, you can patent a statin, you cannot patent sunlight, or you cannot patent uh, grass-fed lard. These are not patentable, even though these might be things that would actually address the root causes. Um, uh, that's Absolutely. So many times I've answered that. People say, but why? Why don't we X? And why isn't this more known? And the quick answer is no patents. No patents. I mean, if there's no profit, we know how the world works. You're not idiots. There's no conspiracy here. It's business. Yeah. And um, I, in my corporate role, we had uh, competitive uh, analysis departments. I sometimes was engaged with them. And yes, anything else that's potentially an alternative product or competitive product, you work to undermine it. It's not just make your product better. Only an idiot in business would depend on making their product better. You make sure you find ways to undermine your competitor. Yep. <laughs> That's the way it works. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. And, and, and you said it's business. Um, I think it's government too. And, and, you know, this is always, this is the, the great root cause uh, problem in political science, which, which I'm oversimplifying it by calling it that, because I don't even know if we can arrive at a root cause to the problem of, of political science. Uh, but is it, is it the, the lobbying of government or is it the government having power that makes people want to lobby the government that is the problem? Because, because just a business trying to make profit necessarily isn't, isn't the issue. It's that the government grants them this special incentive in the form of a monopoly over a medication if they can produce a patentable medication. And that bizarre sort of, uh, it's, it's a disruption of the market in a way because it says, we want to incentivize these sorts of things. And if these sorts of things, patentable medications, only happen to treat symptoms and really can't treat root causes because the thing that treats root causes isn't patentable because it's sunlight, then you've got this strange um, finger on the scales from government grants of monopoly power in the form of patents towards a certain avenue of, um, of treatment, which is, I think you and I would definitely agree, completely the wrong avenue of treatment. And another area that I, I wanted to bring up um, is government subsidies for agriculture. So there is a, a friend of mine after I started, I think, posting some, some of your videos recommended I watch um, King Corn, which is this great documentary that was made a, a number of years back that didn't get much attention, um, but should have, where two guys just decided to grow corn and then track where it went through the food system. And it quickly became an exercise in how can they get their government subsidies in order to do this? And how can they get their check from the government to do this? And then later became an exercise of, oh my God, this is all going to feedlots. This is all going to high fructose corn syrup manufacturing. What we grew isn't even ed ed edible. It's, it's like disgusting starch. I was looking at some statistics before, we, um, before I had you on as a guest and in the U.S., I don't know if it's better in Ireland, in the U.S., we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on agriculture. And most of that over the last uh, 20, 30 years has gone to corn, uh, some of it to soybeans. That ends up everywhere. And, and is that a part of the problem? Because that seems like it might be addressable. And this is me being naive about politics. You know, we'll, we'll just stop them handing out the money. But how, how core is big agriculture in this larger problem of the, the quality of our food? Yeah, it's a huge problem. And, you know, when I said business, uh, not to be anti-business, but rather than conspiracy theory, I often say it's just business. Yeah. So it's not a pejorative term. It's just like for a corporate guy, I've worked on projects where we kept all the data on one thumb drive because we were doing stuff that shouldn't be done. Yeah. I'm just a realist. I know how it works. And a lot of lay people don't. So business, 
lobbying is an enormous problem. So we know the pharmaceutical industry, I think, has more than one lobbyist uh, for every senator in Congress in Washington. And that's just, I think that's just pharma. So those guys are all connected, the buddies. We have a revolving door between the FDA and pharma, between pharma and multiple other organs, NIH. Mm -hmm. So the government and business are kind of now almost conjoined. Now, an interesting thing is, I, a few years ago, I'm a World War II buff, and I came across the definition of fascism, which mm -hmm. I thought was no, some crazy leader, despot, fascism, right? I didn't realize it's actually the alignment between corporate and state. Yep. That's Don't actually that, fascism. Right? Yeah. That's, and we know from the 30s in, in Germany, we got all the big corporates supported Hitler, saw where he was going, and they worked together. That's fascism. Yeah. So what you have now with huge lobbying and revolving doors is a kind of a pseudo-fascism. Um, it's corporate and state are now joined together. So when they give all the patents and they fund all the drugs, the state now is almost like a useful idiot. I, I think they almost just know, well, this is the way we do things. Yeah. If we get a drug and there's a profit, that's great. It's a profit venture. Mm -hmm. So they're not interested in just the sciences anymore. That's the state and the NIH. They're working with their partners. Mm -hmm. And of course, pharma are the smartest guys in the room. <laughs> so they know the way this works. So I think you've, we've got that, that animal has evolved. Yeah. And uh, it's just the way it is now. How can you turn that back? It's extremely hard because once you get to the point that the corporates, in, in this case, and other industries like food industry and all, become enormously wealthy, and they can lobby incredibly effectively. You know, citizens whining <laughs> is very difficult. So I think that's why I and many of us go direct to the grassroots, right. direct to the people, because there's no point going to the government. You're just going to waste your time. You know, trying to argue any of this to the government, they're just going to glaze over. Yeah, and, and it's tragic too. We work with folks in government all the time, and they're all, uh, I, I, can't, I can think of maybe a, a I can count on one hand the number that I've met that have actually been unpleasant or disingenuous people. Almost all of the people I meet are great people who earnestly believe in what they're doing. And even when they're representing something that I believe to be abhorrent or completely wrong, I have to forgive them because we have this bootlegger Baptist problem. Uh, uh, an American political scientist, Bruce Yandel, came up with this. Uh, it's this example of the way lobbying tends to work, which is you've got bootleggers, the rum runners, Al Capone types, who just want to make money off of hooch. And then you've got Baptists who have a genuine notion as to why we should prohibit alcohol, because it's godly or because it's healthier or because alcoholism destroys families. And they are, they are righteous and they are not wrong. They're, they're just maybe pursuing methods to achieve their ends that aren't the best. And what happens is the bootleggers who can make profit off of the policies pushed by the Baptists, they're the money behind the system. And then the Baptists are in the system putting a positive spin on it. But it's not spin because those people believe in the mission. And they don't realize that what they're doing is enriching some of the worst players in the world in the process. And war on drugs is probably a, another kind of analogy kind of thing. So technically, everyone believes this is great war on drugs, but then you're creating all of these problems. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that. Uh, but I just think that the real, the food industry lobbying to government and revolving door and, and, and the pharma are the big ones. I mean, of course, there's the oil industry to an extent. I don't worry about that one as much. It's food. And you mentioned there the subsidies. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. The right guys in the corn industry got in early. The food industry benefited hugely because by putting sugar and seed oils and soy oil into everything, you make a fatter, sicker population who needs to eat more. So you keep your market growing. Also, sugar, starches, and corn are dirt cheap as a raw material, and so are the vegetable oils, seed oils. So you've got a dirt cheap raw material that you've got the government to be happy for you to put in as the subst main substrate in all the foods. So now your margins are huge. And then, I mean, even pharma get to gain because not directly, but they know that the toxic food supply and environment is driving most of the chronic disease that they, of course, supply the pseudo effectual drugs for. So it's all one big mess. And I don't mean to be negative here, but I, the only way to tackle it, I think, is 
education of the grassroots and leadership amongst people out there. Yeah. Um, because you can't tackle the beast directly. I think it's it's just very difficult. Now, in your case, you can maybe in the the kind of stuff you're involved in. We can, but in we the can, whole food pharma mess, oh, we can stop. We can stop the beast from doing too much harm in the early days of a new technology where things mm. are critical, going from zero to one, uh, and and maybe we can get some converts along the way, or uh, at least. Um, sort of anchoring bias, get the right information in there early. Like you said, like, like the corn guys got in there early. Um, hopefully I don't end up like the corn guys. I did want to talk about um, corn oil and seed oil specifically um, and polyunsaturated fats because I've watched your uh, podcast with um, Dr. Chris Nob or is it Nob or Nob? And oh, Kenobi, apparently. Oh, it's Kenobi. Oh, like Obi-Wan. Yeah, I only found that out in Denver. I met him and he finally told me. It's Kenobi. <laughs> That's so much cooler. Um, uh, so, you know, mm. so you were talking about grassroots and how it's kind of the only solution right now. And I, I feel like one of these individuals who I, I've come to believe, and for our listeners who haven't watched your, your work or Chris's work, um, you'll just have to take this as an article of faith and then please watch um, Ivor's work uh, to understand why. But I take it as an article of faith that I'd much rather deep fry in lard um, than in seed oils. And as you said, restaurants are going to only uh, deep fry things in seed oils because those oils are subsidized if they're corn oil and so they're super cheap. They'd probably be cheap anyway because we've created this mutant corn crop that's very easy to turn into oil and high fructose corn syrup. And so now I'm in this weird position. My, my one cheat, Ivor, and I will confess to you as sort of my... Um, as, as my, my priest of nutrition, not to make this sound like a cult, but... I will confess that my vice is still Indian food and specifically samosas, which are incredibly delicious, but they're deep fried. Uh -huh. I've wanted I'm salivating. To <laughs> <laughs> I've wanted to go to my local Indian restaurant and I love this I love this restaurant and say, I will pay you extra to give me the samosas before they're fried and I'll take them home and I'll fry them in lard, which will be expensive in itself because lard's not cheap. Um, but there seems like there's such limits to actually doing it yourself. Cause I can't, I, I, if I really want to be true to what I now believe, I have trouble going to restaurants. I have trouble um, eating, eating at a, at a friend's house. And I'm not crazy about this. I will happily eat a friend's dinner if it has a bunch of refined carbohydrates or seed oils, but it's very hard. You have to be sort of, you have to be religious about it in a way. You, mm. <laughs> you know, the, do the dose defines the poison. Yeah. So rea the reality is going to a restaurant, I don't go that often. I mean, they're quite expensive in Ireland. You know, I have a big family. Uh, but when you go to a restaurant, there's a couple of simple tricks. You can go for the meals that are going to be less adulterated. So you just get steamed vegetables and a big kick-ass steak ribeye. Yeah. Now, look, they might have used a bit of vegetable oil in the pan you can actually say to them, I've told people, you can say, actually, sorry, I'm kind of allergic to the vegetable oils. Uh, could you just do it in butter or something else? But, you know, no big scene. And they can mention it and the chef can just throw it on the griddle. Uh, you know, so you can get yourself meat and uh, veg. Yeah. That really, there's, there's no problem. Uh, but if you want to get your samosas and they are gorgeous uh, and things like that, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. They're not going to deep fry especially for you. Now, we have an Indian locally in Ireland uh, called Chutney, uh, and it's a takeaway, but they also have a very expensive sit-down restaurant in, in Dublin town, and they are different. And they use tallow, and they use the fats, and they are super traditional. This is very rare, yeah. uh, and they are amazing. Now I'm so, salivating and it's the morning uh, here instead of the afternoon. I got it. I got to eat a napkin here. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to be respectful of your time. We're coming up on, on uh, 50 minutes an hour, but I, I wanted to ask you one last question related to the seed oils specifically. And at this point we'll have lost all the, uh, the listeners who aren't already into this nutrition stuff. So I feel like I can get a little bit in the weeds, but my recent, um, my recent thinking has, has been based heavily on, Dr. Kenobi's uh, research on on PUFA, that he seems to argue, and 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 I'm, I'm I just really want your take on this, that the root cause of insulin resistance is in fact um, the oxidation of of PUFAs 
and the uh, the problems with your lipid membranes in your in your system that ultimately lead to the sort of metabolic syndrome insulin resistance in which case i i feel like maybe if i could just fry my potato and wheat samosas in lard i'd be okay I, i've been pretty strictly uh, very low carb and intermittent fasting for the last few years but the notion that maybe i could have some carbs as long as i don't eat seed oils is interesting to me do you um, what do you think of that yeah, this is a tricky one because there's good mechanistic science and associational science uh, on both sides. I, uh, an old manager I used to work for was a really tough guy and he used to have a phrase, it's an and. So, you know, we'd be saying, do we focus on this program or this program? And he'd just say, it's an and, you do both. So I think there's an element of it's an and. It is refined carbohydrate, that's the problem, and seed oils. Yeah. And it's been debated, you know, is it 50-50, rough and tough? You know, is it 70-30? And it's very hard to answer the question. I think that refined carbohydrate through the upper intestine, the, uh, the hormones that are there, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, GIP, yeah. that is the driver of insulin release, refined carbohydrates, uh, sugars, especially when they're eaten with fats, they're potentiated, you get a bigger insulin release. Mm -hmm. That's all a problem. And then we've got the other mechanisms. And Dr. Mike Eads, who wrote Protein Power Book series, good friend of mine on the West Coast, he recently gave lectures on that very science, how the PUFAs through the electron transport chain mm -hmm. have this problematic effect. Mm -hmm. And I think, not to dodge the question, I, I think it is an and. Yeah. And it's very hard to tell, especially with individual variability in your response to foods yeah. added. It's very hard to tell which is worse. I think the combination is terrible. Uh, sugar, refined carbs, and seed oils are the devil's triad of the 20th century that underpin most modern chronic disease. But when you separate them, it gets harder to quantify. Uh, another thing that I always say to people if you ate 70% carbohydrate by energy diet and you always ate it, but it was just potatoes and it was plantains and vegetables and you had some fish and all, like the Catavans who have no heart disease, sweet you potato, do that right? from when you're a baby and you're out in the sun and you're healthy, you can have a 70% carb diet your whole life and be healthy as hell. The problem we have now is we've broken the metabolic machinery of the majority of say americans mm -hmm. and now a 52 year old accountant who's got diabetic physiology that person can no longer eat a healthy carb diet like the catavans because now they've actually damaged their metabolism and they're now carbohydrate intolerant yeah right so a lot of the problem is if you're a relatively young with a very healthy metabolism you can have a diet like a catavan higher in carbs I'd still say, though, not really sugars and refined grains and, and those carbohydrates. Yeah. So if, if, uh, if you're a listener out there and you're thinking like, oh, well, I'm skinny, I'm all right. Uh, this guy, uh, three years ago, sometimes higher, but often 140 over 90 blood pressure. And that was enough for me to realize that at my age, that's insane. And I'm skinny as a rail, but I was metabolically yeah. obese in some way or metabolically dysfunctional. So if you're listening yeah. and you think like, oh, I'm one who can eat like a catavan, um, think twice. You might want to get your blood pressure checked. Like, get a home reader, take it every day because it seems like a, a reasonable m metric, right? Absolutely. That is so important to stress. I can't believe as well I glossed over because the reality is, yeah, it's metabolically truly healthy as opposed to being apparently slim. Yeah. So right now in America, non-obese, there's probably more people heading for heart attacks with metabolic disease who are not obese just because there's a lot more in that category. And it's tofu, thin outside, fat inside. I have guys who are super fit, uh, slim as a whippet, and I mean no protruding stomach, I don't mean just not obese, who even had okay looking blood glucose, but their insulin and glucose after a meal, when they measured it, it was huge, and they had enormous heart disease, and they were type two diabetic. Mm -hmm. So, some of the slimmer people and Asian extraction people and, and other genetic lineages, they actually are not able to become uh, very fat very easily. And as Dr. Ron Rosedale said once, I love the phrase, he said, 
diabetes is the price you pay for not being able to get fatter. So everyone has a personal fat threshold. If you have genetics that allow you to keep expanding your fat cells and getting really fat, you'll stave off becoming type 2 diabetic. But if you're a type of person, and it could be Caucasian, though Indian is, is much more likely, mm. who simply gets a small tummy and then bam, they're diabetic because they don't really expand fat very well. Mm. So very, yeah, you gotta be, it's not the skin, it's slimness, it's the insulin measurement in your blood. It's a continuous blood glucose meter or even a little meter you can check after meals. It's verifying your machinery is in great working order. And that does not respect fat versus thin. It yeah. doesn't care. And the nonprofit you've worked with in the past that does the calcium scan, that's another good metric, right? That's a huge one. And that's kind of middle-aged, middle-risk person. You're not sure, do I have a problem? Do I not have a problem with heart disease? Simple, walk in and get a $100 CAC score from a CT scan of the heart, the yeah. calcium scan. Uh, America, a lot of places it's walk in, and you'll immediately find out your degree of arterial disease. Right. And if it's high, it, there's no reason to panic. Better to know if you get a high score like 500. That's a huge risk today. But if you address the things we were talking about and more, you can stop that score rising. And someone who stops it rising goes back to the safety level of someone who had a low score in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's all about knowing, taking action. You fix the disease, then your risk plummets. So you got to know. Okay, uh, last question, because we're, we're coming up at the end of the time. Um, you talked about ANDS, and you talked about um, uh, the triad, uh, sugar being one of those things in the triad. What about alcohol? What about my red wine? And I know your red wine as well. Is fructose the same? Is sugar the same um, sort of baddie as, as, uh, as alcohol? And, and is it an AND, or is it okay? <laughs> yeah, it's oh, dose defines the poison again, an individual tolerance. So I would say uh, I don't eat sugar or sugary drinks or refined carbohydrates generally, except as you say, the cheat where you have those samosas or something. But you got to be careful with that because if it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. You know yourself. Start taking an occasional cigarette when you're off them. Within a few weeks, you're back in a pack. So, so there is that. Uh, alcohol, yeah, I am very fond of wine. I love wine at the end of my working day with my meal and after. And if you're having a couple of glasses, I'd say no problemo. Hmm. Uh, the problem is when you're overindulgent in wine, essentially you're, you're pushing your liver in a similar way that sugar does. Maybe not quite as bad calorie for calorie, but the reality is you're stopping the burning of fat you can pile in a lot of calories before you know it with wine. It's seven calories a gram for alcohol. So you're putting in a lot of calories and keeping your liver busy trying to detoxify. And, and it's not ideal. But a glass or two of wine at your dinner, even daily, that's why we see that it's associated with longer life. It actually improves your lipoprotein profile. But this moderation thing is the thing, a glass or two. What if you're having a bottle or a bottle and a quarter? every day now you're in a different space that early well. in covid that may have been me and my wife i'm just saying with the quarantine it got a, <laughs> <laughs> hey i i'm going to admit it publicly okay i was the fat emperor but it was an ironic title uh and on and off when i've been really stressed in my corporate and under intense pressure for months i put weight back on yeah. and then i peel it back off again uh, this three months, I've been working on COVID seven days a week, uh, enormously. And because it's been so crazy what's been going on, I've indulged. I've put on probably around maybe 12 pounds over the few months, quite substantial amount. But I'm going to have to pull it back before I'm, I'm out in public again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can't tell here so much. You look great, Ivor. <laughs> Yeah, I know. What, what's fascinating about that sugar alcohol comparison, though, is the thing I never realized before was that sugar is basically as bad or worse for your liver than alcohol. And it's so much less fun because um, you don't get drunk. And we give it to children like it's just fine. We market it to kids and it's outrageous. It also reminds me of um, Dr. Kenobi has the, uh, the comparison between a, a McDonald's fries, the amount of acrolein, a carcinogen in the fries, compared to 80 cigarettes. We give them to kids. Yeah. We make them happy meals. It's outrageous. 
It's outrageous. And as Professor Robert Lustig said, and I love the phrase, he's kind of a pal of mine now. Um, he said, sugar is the alcohol of the child. Nice and simple, because that's what it is. You know, that's what it is. So sad. Well, I did want to get into some of the COVID stuff, but I don't think we have time today. So maybe we'll, we'll come back in a future podcast, because um, just to give you a plug, uh, your videos on seasonality uh, of, of coronaviruses, including our novel coronavirus, your videos on the potential for herd immunity, your videos, um, you interviewed a, a brilliant guy whose name I don't remember who was talking about um, T cell and B cell immunity, things that wouldn't show up in an antibody test, but could mean that you and a sizable part of the population are not vulnerable to infection are fascinating. And once again, um, using uh, sort of root causes and mechanisms and thoughtful analysis, bucking the trend of the orthodoxy, which in this case is to have a very dark view of the dangers of this disease, which, you know, it's dangerous, but is it, yeah. is it uh, something that warrants mandated lockdowns and things like that? So uh, if you want to say anything about your work there, I, well, I think you should find your stuff because I think it's really important and we'll have to have you on again for, for that. Oh, we can certainly circle back. So I just say that let's just stick with Sweden. So Sweden actually did no lockdown, no masks, and now their society is buzzing again. I mean, politically, they're saying they've still got restrictions, but there's video footage in Sweden and they never locked down. Hair salons went ahead. Bars were there with a little bit of token spacing, but there was no masks ever used. Yeah. Uh, their uh, death curve, sadly, a Gompertz function went up and came right down and now it's down at the, on the floor, like all of Europe. They're mm -hmm. around the same deaths per million as the average of Europe and they've got de facto herd immunity. And again, my interviews with the immunologists will explain that. Uh, and, and there you have it. The biggest thing that affects a country's actual performance is nothing to do with lockdowns. The biggest thing is how hard or soft were your prior couple of years flu seasons. Mm. So Sweden had a lower than expected death rate quite strikingly in 19, 2019. And the people, sadly, you know, there was dry tinder in a sense. People I mean, who is, did not this is pass. This death rate from things like influenza. Respiratory season death rate. Absolutely. So to give another little example, Europe in 2018, during the six-month respiratory season, influenza, etc., there were 140,000 extra deaths across 400 million people, approx. And that's normal and we accept it. It's the way it is. Uh, 2020 now, Europe has around 180,000 excess deaths, but they're in a much sharper spike because Europe had soft season since 19. So a lot of susceptible people who would have been taken before, a lot of them were not taken. So when Corona came along and seasonally triggered, it took a lot of people very fast. Hence the Italian kind of footage of hospitals and occasional hospitals in other areas of Europe. So really, Corona just did what a bad flu does, uh, but it came along at a certain time where there were a lot of people susceptible. So it really made a striking, short, dramatic. And you see all over the world this uh, in Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but the reality is, the actual fact is, it is on a level of a very severe flu. So maybe twice as bad as a bad flu, you might be fair to say, but that only makes it as bad as a severe flu. Yeah. And certainly nothing like the 1918 Spanish flu. I released a graph today from a Swedish guy who did incredible analysis. And you can see the spike in the months of the Spanish flu 1918. And they completely go way off the graph of mortality per million. Mm -hmm. And then to be honest, Corona, it's hard to distinguish Corona versus the last 10 or 20 years. The spike barely sticks out at all. It's, it's tiny. So this, I might send you a link to that. I, I love that. And this is so important because every death is tragic. And I, I know people yeah. uh, who know people who've, who've died from this and it's yeah. terrible. But we need to put it into perspective and we need to understand that people die all the time from the flu, which is awful. Um, and I, I, I guess... Um, I think it's interesting on the, on, the, on the immunity side, which is the, the work you've done recently that I find really fascinating. 
I think we're starting to see a little bit of a change in even mainstream media treatment of this. We've seen actually, um, I think, some good reporting from sources like the New York Times and things like that talking about maybe there's some optimism for herd immunity. So I think you were you well ahead of the curve there, and, and, and hopefully um, we can have a, a more sober look at, at good government policies towards this. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if you look at my timeline, the last 10 videos released on my YouTube channel, Ivor Cummins YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, I've got several experts and you, you'll see from the titles what the content is. And I've also got a few short videos with just me explaining the data. So if people are interested, they'll find a lot there. But to your last point, yes, orthodoxy is slowly, reluctantly acknowledging a prior immunity. And I just want to leave people with one thought on that, the absurdity of it. So I interviewed Professor Bida Stadler, who's the Swiss Fauci. Yeah. He was the head of the immunology kind of center, and he's known as the vaccine pope. So he was a hugely orthodox guy, massively into vaccines. Credibility, right? My interview with him, he explained it all. He said, what's going on is he calls his colleagues immunity deniers, his immunologist colleagues. And they've explained to him, we're not allowed to talk about this. The narrative is set and we've got careers. And he gave just an example, which I had brought up before. When they've done tracking of symptomatic, actual symptomatic COVID people, and they've gone through all of their uh, people who cohabit and close people who they have met with indoors with no masks, mm -hmm. around 70 or 80 percent never get it. Mm. And what people don't realize is the enormity of what that says. It says that 70 or 80 percent of us are de facto immune from the get go. Right. So when Corona came in, there's 70 or 80 percent of people from the get go who are not really going to get it anyway. So the herd immunity argument made that we need to get to 70 percent. Well, hold on a minute around 70% are already done yeah, before yeah, yeah. it starts. Now you've got 20 or 30% with varying degrees of susceptibility or lack of immunity, and they're going to have to get it and build that. And you've got a tiny fraction. On an average in a country, 500 in a million people will actually die. Yeah. And 500 in a million. Yeah. And they'll be aged and morbid, comorbid. Not, not that their lives aren't, of course it's sad, but they will be overwhelmingly aged and comorbid. Yeah. So people just need to understand the basic numbers without getting too emotional about it. It is very sad. It's very impactful. But guys, we need to run a world here. We can't turn everything off and cause trillion dollar debts and cause massive collateral death and suffering around the world uh, on the basis of running after something that what we do is not going to really change the outcome much anyway. Yeah, sad. And that's uh, the last point I want to make is that's why I think your your work um, popularizing these ideas and explaining them to people who need to understand them is so important because uh, my my initial reaction was how could seventy people seventy percent of people already be immune to something that they've never faced and it's because I had a naive view of immunity this notion that you only have immunity when you develop antibodies in response to an infection or a vaccine and you broke down um, with some of your guests in, again, great, great um, presentations and clip art, the real nature of immunity, which is that it involves an innate immune system that just kills anything that looks dangerous, uh, T cell and B cell immunity, which could be uh, cross species. So you had a coronavirus before and parts of that coronavirus are recognized as a threat. So you might be immune to the new coronavirus. There's so much richness there. And I understand people who are, feel like maybe right now listening to us that we're conspiratorial. Uh, it's not conspiracy. It's just that Data. people have simplified visions of the world uh, and, and they make strong conclusions based on those, those, those notions. And the best thing we can do, and I, again, I can't, I can't applaud you enough for doing this, is think more hard about the actual mechanisms and root causes so that we can come to better conclusions that aren't just based on you know, this simple thing, this simple yeah. antibody test yeah. is how we'll determine when we've reached herd immunity. Anyway, yeah. ever, I've taken up um, more time of yours than I should have, <laughs> especially given that you're under siege right now a bit. Uh, so a thank little. you so much for coming on our show and um, hope to have you back again soon. Great stuff, man. Let's, let's do that. A few weeks or whatever. Thank you.
Take care, Ivor. Bye now.